കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ഈദ Namaste. So I thought because we haven't got a lot of excitement on the channel lately <laughs> I would answer some of the questions and comments that I get that aren't exactly relevant to the topics of the videos. Usually I remove these comments because they're irrelevant and they don't really further the discussion. on the particular series that I'm doing. But because I get them again and again, I think they must be relevant to some section of our viewers. And so I wanted to address them in a short video just to clear up these issues. One comment that I get, a question rather, is what happened to your online courses? Well, we have an online course site which is here. and it was going for i don't know 3 or 4 months but unfortunately the people who volunteered to help out didn't really hold up their part of the bargain and i eventually found that the whole thing was simply dumped in my lap uh and i didn't want that role i was willing to create the site and you know set up the software and the courses and all that but as far as like marking everybody's quizzes and and stuff like that it's just it's not what i should be doing you know i should be researching new topics making videos and dealing with uh people's live interactions so that didn't happen and the, way, the reason it didn't happen was i guess because of coronavirus and just because people in general don't seem to keep their promises so especially when the planets went wet- retrograde i decided to just close the whole thing down at least for now and let's see where we're at in september or october maybe we'll reopen it especially if i could get some help with the ongoing administration of the site next some people ask me well, why don't you have an ashram or some kind of organization and the answer is i've had it up to here with organizations <laughs> uh i if you've been watching this channel for any time you probably know i was involved with iscon in the early days starting in the 1960s and all the way through like 2011 i was involved with krishna consciousness although not directly with iskon i had my own organization i had disciples from all over the world we had several ashrams in mexico city in chile in uh two or three places in india kumbakonam coimbatore and like that kerala and you know what i got tired of being everybody's daddy and mommy It's like these are adult people. Why can't they manage their own affairs? And also they're supposed to be sadhus, meaning they should be renounced. And the politics, oh, the politics was so ugly it was never ending. And the corruption. Several of the so-called disciples wanted to use the organization for their own purposes. They wanted to set up a, another ashram. and i think they had some illegal business in mind so when i put a stop to that basically i got sick and tired of the whole thing and i decided to resign but when i announced my resignation the the students who wanted to use the organization for their own purposes retaliated by creating a huge scandal which was a real pain to deal with it was a lot of online stalking and all kinds of nonsense rumors and stuff for years so it's like i've had it with organizations in kali yuga organizations are all corrupt and the bigger they are 
the more corrupt they are. And we'll come back to this point in another question later on. Another question that I get, actually pretty often is, your videos are great. They're full of information. Why don't you get more views? Or why don't you get more intelligent comments? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know exactly. I think one insight is I just don't have that, you know, internet star vibe. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy, you know? I don't put on any guru vibes and all this stuff, you know? And uh, I'm just a plain, ordinary looking person. I don't have much star appeal or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, this is very deliberate on my part. Of course, I, I could learn social skills and be charming and all that, you know, but I think it distracts from the message. I think it detracts from the purity of the work that I'm doing. You know, it's kind of a, kind of a just the facts, ma'am, attitude. I mean, I try to be pleasant and personable in the videos and not get into any negativity and all of that. But that's not the same as, you know, having an institutional title and the credibility that goes along with it or a string of degrees after my name or whatever, you know, people find attractive about these different commercial teachers. I don't have that kind of personality. And I think it's a blessing. It's good because it saves me from being too popular and then being distracted from my work and my sadhana by a, a lot of social interactions. And I'm actually much happier now that I don't have an organization, that I don't have a lot of followers. <laughs> Because most of the interactions involved are trivial. They're not really the kind of quality th communications that I enjoy. So, <laughs> one question or comment that I get a lot on the site is, why don't you wear a shirt? <laughs> well, because it's in India and it's hot. That's one reason. Another reason is I'm a sannyasi. And in India, sannyasis and pujaris generally don't wear shirts. And of course, there's been a trend recently where sannyasis get all dressed up in nice silk robes or kurtas and, uh, you know, maybe real cool looking. Uh, kind of head cloths and this and that. But, you know, I just don't get into that. I am a very simple person. I like to be natural. I like to be simple and in tune with nature. I don't wear clothes a lot. Only whatever is necessary. Even in the winter. And I think this austerity keeps me very much in touch with nature. I can feel more what's going on around me. And I like that. I don't like to be insulated from my environment by wearing too much clothing. And a related question is, why do you paint your face with that stuff? <laughs> One person called it mud. Well, it's not mud, it's sacred ash from the sacrificial fires in the temples. And actually I have a whole series explaining it, so I'm not gonna explain it here, but I'm just gonna put a link. Now here's a good question. Why did you change your religion? I mean, it's actually a substantial question, but the way in which it's most often uh, commented, posted on the site is, Damn you, you changed your religion. <laughs> and because that's not the proper way to pose this question, I remove those comments. But it's a, really, from one point of view, it's a fact. I used to be in ISKCON, I used to be 
a Vaishnava, Hare Krishna. And then I quit. I was even a guru and I resigned. And I walked away from that whole scene over 20 years in the same community. And I went completely into a study of Buddha's teaching. I even went to Sri Lanka and became a monk for more than five years. And then I moved back to India and I dropped being a Buddhist monk and I became a Shaivite, an Advaita, Advaitin. And then <laughs> I started studying Shaktaism. And the reason for all this is probably going to take up the rest of the video. Just like when I was in America growing up and I found so many questions that my family's Christian religion just couldn't answer. And so I became uh, not an atheist, but an agnostic. And I started looking into yoga and Vedic teachings and like that. And then I got introduced to my guru, Srila Prabhupada, my Adi guru, first guru. And he brought me to India in 1971 and initiated me into Gayatri Mantra and taught me so many things. He was really a very, very powerful influence on my life. And I benefited so much from his association. But after years and years as a devotee of Krishna, I started studying the literature, the early literature. And the deeper I got into it, the more doubts I had. <laughs> and finally, I did a big research project, took a couple of years, on the Vedanta Sutra. Now, of course, the Vaishnavas have their own commentary on Vedanta Sutra. And when I started researching it, I started to understand that the Vaishnavas' views were completely at odds with the actual Vedic conclusions. As we've discussed just in today's episode of the Drig Drishya Viveka, the Upanishads very firmly conclude that Brahman is the absolute and that anything with form is part of the creation, the manifold, the jagra, and that includes the gods and the heavens and all of that stuff. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with worshiping Krishna as an incarnation of Vishnu and the other Vaishnava lineages, such as the Ramanujacharya, Vishnu Swami, and so on, they do that very nicely without denying the primacy of Brahman. So I don't know why exactly, well, I can speculate why, but I, I don't have a lot of proof to back it up, why the Iskan Hare Krishnas uh, try to replace Brahman with Krishna, because that's not Vedic, but yet they want to claim the authority of the Vedas and so on. Anyway, it's a big ethical problem, and philosophical problem and that led to my losing faith in that teaching. So while I still to this day respect and love Srila Prabhupada like a father, I had to leave that lineage because I just couldn't support anymore representing a teaching that I felt to be off. So uh, that's the reason I left. But then I decided I don't want to be in a faith-based mindset. I want to be in an experiential mindset. In other words, everything about a spiritual teaching should be verifiable in experience. So that attracted me to the Buddha's teaching. And I don't want to say Buddhism. See, this is where things get tricky. <laughs> because what is a religion? A religion is a set of beliefs that one takes on faith. And Buddhism today is just as much of a religion as the Hare Krishnas or the Jesus people, uh, you know, the religious fundamentalists, where they say faith is everything. And facts are, well, you know, not so important. No, we say the opposite, that facts are supremely important and 
your philosophy has to explain the facts of human life. Otherwise, it's not valid. In other words, I should be able to observe your teaching in my everyday life. And in Buddha's teaching, not Buddhism, which is a religion based on Buddha's teaching, in Buddha's original teaching and original sutras, I found a teaching that I could observe in my everyday life, that I could practice and see the result immediately. I don't have to wait until I die. I can get the result right now. So this was very exciting. And after five years of meditating in a stone cottage up in the mountains of Sri Lanka, I felt that I had got everything that I could get out of it. And also because I was pretty much disgusted with the, the organization of Buddhism, the religion, I left. And I was independent for a while, and after a journey all around India and Nepal, I settled in South India. And I was gradually drawn to Tiruvannamalai, and I became a disciple of Ramana Maharshi. And he also has a teaching that is directly experiential, uh, if you actually follow it. But then I found in my video work that I was talking over people's heads. In other words, they weren't understanding the, uh, the Vedanta or the Advaita teaching properly. They were trying to jump up without the proper background. So I felt I have to also present a karma yoga and bhakti yoga teaching that is also harmonious with the Vedic conclusions. And I was very fortunate to find Shankaracharya's teaching of the four Vadas. And so I'm going to po put up the good old chart <laughs> that here is the Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Ajata Vada, the four stages. So I felt that my teaching, my work, my ability to help people is not complete unless I could give them the uh, means to approach meditation, the vivartavada, and get the proper qualifications so they could be successful. So then started a two-year journey into the teaching of Shaktism, the worship of Shakti, or the power of God, Maya, huh? Maya Devi, the creation rather than the creator. And this is a unique thing in Vedic culture. This is something very wonderful, I think. This enables people to gather enough pious credits called punya, means good karma, to be able to sit down and meditate and actually get the result. So now we're working with the Lalita Sahasranam and other scriptures on the Shakta, tradition, and that gives people the ability to prepare themselves properly for meditation, and in that way they can easily be successful. So I'm running out of time <laughs> with one more question. Why is your channel full of contradictory topics? Well, actually I just answered that. The processes and principles of the four vadas are often at odds with one another. For example, in the Dvaita Vada, one has to perform so many rituals and follow so many rules in order to be successful. But once you are successful, you develop bhakti, love of God, which is spontaneous and beyond rules and regulations. And then when bhakti is successful, one comes to the platform of Raja Yoga and meditation, and one drops all rituals and all gods and goddesses and all actually all conceptions of everything and simply meditates on pure consciousness. And when that process is complete, one attains full self-realization, which is the Ajatta platform, in which one sees that the creation or the material world was never born. That's the meaning of ajatta. 
And so I hope I've addressed some of these questions. If you have any more, leave a comment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.